I'm Tim Reynolds and I do the technology development for Seafarer. I've been doing engineering for uh, 30 plus years and primarily in the area of geolocation, locating things. So developing technologies that can look beneath the ocean floor and identify the materials or the residuals of a shipwreck. Well, everybody hears about the Treasure Coast, which are the remnants of a single fleet of ships, which was from 1715. What we're actually looking for is of that particular fleet in Melbourne area, there are multiple ships that sank at sea and were never found. And those have never been salvaged, those have never been um, even found, and we're on the track of at least one of those shipwrecks now. To, to learn that the Spanish have basically raided South Middle America for 300 years and then shipped um, all this treasure of gold from Cuba at the end of the day to, to Spain. And then one of the 10 ships wouldn't make it is what kind of brought my attention to this whole story. A lot of people think a shipwreck you, you dive and, and the shipwreck is just sitting there on the ocean floor, but in 300 years that shipwreck has actually melted into the ocean floor. So if you stripped away all the water and swam al and walked along the ocean floor, um, you wouldn't see a shipwreck. Um, if you think about it, a regular treasure hunter, um, they have a wreck, they have one wreck, and they dig up this one wreck for five years. And after five years they either broke or they made it. What those guys have done in the past is incredible, but it is truly based on a combination of research, luck, and time. A lot of time. I mean, the hours and the sacrifice and all the rest that the, that the Fisher Group put into their finds is mind-blowing. It's a, it's a life journey for them. It truly was. With Seasum, if the sea searcher now basically can trim this, those five years down to a weekend, essentially. So after a couple of days scanning, we can tell you whether or not there is something there or not. And that changes the, the, econo the whole economy, the whole economics of, of this um, industry. One of the ways that Seafair is, is changing the game is a, a person who f believes they found a shipwreck could work that shipwreck site for years even decades and never find anything. So most of the time, I call that, most treasure hunting is a binary activity. You pick a site and you work it and you work it and you spend millions of dollars working it and it either comes up with treasure or it comes up with nothing. So the whole purpose of the technology we're developing for Seafarer is intended to reduce the cost of evaluating a site and determining whether or not there's precious materials on that site worth additional investment. If we can do that, that changes the nature of the, of the game for treasure hunting because you would go to a site, run the sea search or run the technologies over it, evaluate it, and then decide whether or not you're going to continue to invest in that site. Both, that's both important from a monetary perspective but also from a cultural resource perspective because if we can identify where the cultural resources are you're not damaging them by using blowers to blow holes in the sand or blow holes and, and damaging the artifacts you can actually go right to where the things that are the most interesting are and, and recover them so for example if you look at the uh, Atosha um, which according to the record was in effect found by mistake it was found by accident. Um, a diver was swimming along, noticed an, an anomaly, reached in, and then all of a sudden noticed there were silver bars there. One of the challenges with all of these artifacts that have been on the ocean floor for centuries is that they become encrusted. We found wood with a half an inch of encrustation on it, shell encrustation on it. You find metals with encrustation. One of the few metals that doesn't tend to get encrusted is gold, but if it's inside something that can get encrusted, that gold could, get it, could uh, be in a container that's encrusted as well. If you're diving along on a mature uh, area, you may never see it. And like I said, these shipwrecks have melted into the ocean floor. So that's what they were doing. They were swimming along and not seeing it, where the sea searcher and the technologies that we're developing would have identified that there was silver right where they were, right where they were diving. And so it, allow, it, and it, and it gives them the position of it, and it gives them the approximate depth of it. 
So the idea of going from I search an area with whether it's a handheld metal detector and blowers or whatever they're using to you're flying a, a drone along that's giving you locations of where to dig is, is a big change. <laughs> Seafair is sort of, it's sort of disguised as a treasure hunting company or a marine salvage company. But in reality, like I say, it's a tech company. It is a hundred percent tech company. Companies that do this now, they try and salvage, you know, artifacts or things of value off of these sites. If you understand how they do that now, magging, creating a thousand targets in a little area. And then over the next, you know, 40 days of dive time that you get in each individual year, trying to then dive each one of those, determine if there's anything there to go, go after. And then you spend the next several years trying to determine where on each of those sites you dive. It is a ridiculously inefficient process. It just is. It's a big scratch off and you're completely at the mercy of the elements. And you only have limited time in the year where you can physically get out there to do these things. Everything points to the fact that if you want to do this and do it successfully and not just rely on complete luck, you have to have technology to allow you to do it. For me, the light bulb moment was understanding that this allows you to take away all of that inefficiency and replace it with a really efficient scientific process. And that is something you can depend on for a long-term success. My name is Dante Volpe. I'm a uh, one of the main engineers that works here at Seafarer Exploration. I work on all the technology. I'm also out on the boats regularly, diving, surveying, collecting data, processing the data. I have my hands in a lot of uh, different aspects of our day-to-day -day operations. Here at Seafarer, we're working on several tech projects, but the main proprietary project right now is the Sea Searcher. The Sea Searcher is a drone ROV that is uh, a platform that contains specialized side scan sonar array as well as a pulse inductor system. We use the Sea Searcher to identify and locate targets at and below the sea floor. Uh, with both the sonar and the pulse inductor, we're able to get a relative idea of the depth of the target, the size of the target. Uh, we can differentiate between certain metals as well as ferrous and non-ferrous uh, for those items. And th this is all done to give us a better idea and a better location on some of these targets so that we're not wasting time sending divers at arbitrary magnetometer hits that are just going to be iron targets. So we try to give our divers the best possibility of finding something of interest. Um, and we do that through our sea searcher technology. So ferrous and non-ferrous, when we're talking about it in this context, we're, the ferrous items are mostly identified by a magnetometer. They're going to be iron rich or iron items. Steel will also show up. So, when you're doing a mag survey, you're going to get many ferrous items, many iron items, but you're not going to see any of the non-ferrous items. And that could be modern aluminum trash, but it also could be the gold, silver, the treasure, the historical, uh, in the historical context. So when we're looking for items, a lot of it will be in close association. A lot of the non-ferrous could be in close association with the ferrous items. Uh, because in a shipwreck, especially from this time period, you're going to have iron spikes, iron riggings. You'll find barrel hoops, mast rings, dead eyes, rudder pinholes. Uh, the list goes on. I mean, there's plenty of iron items that were used in this time period. Even some of the tools that they would have used, uh, all made out of uh, that ferrous material. Some of the non-ferrous items that you can find on these ships as well could be uh, their precious metal cargo such as gold and silver, that's the obvious ones that come to mind. But they also had various decorative items depending on the class of ship and where it was from that could be non-ferrous. Uh, some of these would be you know, brass spikes, bronze fittings, some of cannons were made out of bronze. Um, and you'll have varying non-ferrous historic items that could help give us better context as to what type of ship it was and where it came from. So finding all of these items and differentiating between them is a very important aspect of what we do. So, so let's talk about Juno really quick. What's exciting about Juno? Oh, I can tell you. <laughs> Go ahead. It is a massive wreck. This ship is 
huge. And, and the, the second thing is, a lot of the shipwreck was covered up uh, with this Torito crust. Mm. And divers that went down ahead of us, you know, over the last 50 years or so, um, didn't realize that this was covered with Torito crust. They didn't know what it was. They mm. didn't hire archaeologists like what we do, right? Yep. And, and so they didn't realize what they were looking at. Yeah. Yeah, so we're extremely excited about this because with that Torito crust protecting the wreck site, you know, there, there's comments you hear out on the Internet, oh, that site's been looked over. With Juno, this wreck, because we feel strongly it's in the mid-1500s, uh, one of the guys, Roger Smith, who was the state archaeologist at the time, dated it uh, 1554. But we don't know why he dated it that. And, and, and he passed away, so I can't mm. ask him, how did you come up with that date, right? It's just huge. And because it's the 1500s, you know, they were still killing the Incas and Mayas and Aztecs and all that kind of stuff, the Spanish were. And, and during this period of time, I think that uh, it potentially could have had Aztec-type uh, uh, artifacts, like, you know, gods that they would pray to, uh, shields that they would wear maybe on their chest or uh, bracelets and, and things like that that they would wear or ornamental type stuff. And, and if it did have original, and I'm not saying it did because I don't know, okay, but that stuff would just be awesome to find. That That's all pure museum pieces. Right. And, and that's certainly something we want to do is be able to show the world this and that's why we made the decision to not sell the treasure. Right. And, you know, the, there's nobody that I know of that, that does that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying I don't know anybody that does that. Right. Down here, you know, somebody finds a silver coin. They're at the pawn shop in a heartbeat, man. State doesn't get it. Nobody gets it but the pawn shop. And, and you know, so we, we've got a whole different program going. To your point, Kyle, the conversational or the conservational right, yeah. really piece of what uh, of what you're all doing or how you've structured the company where you're not like taking the stuff to the pawn shop to, I mean, so to speak, you know, right. um, that feeds right into what you were saying, Tim, it, like you guys are going about it in a way that is really sensitive and helpful to the archaeological and ecological communities. And it, it drives all the way back to how we document what we find mm. because for an artifact to be of museum quality for an artifact to be of its highest both cultural and monetary value they it, a lot of archaeologists will never put a monetary value on something only a cultural value the cultural value and the monetary value are both optimized if you properly document the provenance of that artifact Right. how you found it, what it looks like, how you conserve it, and how you curate it. So you can't separate one from the other. Mm -hmm. We have to do all those things at a very high level because if that artifact is never going to be taken to the pawn shop, never going to be sold for its gold weight, which is really what they wind up selling them for usually, not much more than that, if you, we have to do all that stuff. Right. And a lot of folks don't take that into account when they're, the traditional treasure hunting isn't mm. like that. So, so we are, you know, far more of a, or, you know, archaeological exploration and conservation than we are uh, to that ilk than a, than a treasure hunter.